The Buddha gives two main sets of images for the hindrances. One set has to do with water. Ideally, you want to be able to see your reflection in the surface of the water. But with the different kinds of hindrances, you can't, for different reasons. Sensual desires, like water that has been treated with dye, it's murky, the color is all wrong, it's not clear. Ill will is like boiling water, you can't see a reflection in that. Sloth and torpor is like water that's got a lot of sludge and slime. Restlessness and anxiety is like water that has wind blowing over the surface, creating a lot of ripples. Doubt and uncertainty is like stagnant water placed in a dark place. You're certainly not going to see a reflection there. He also compares the hindrances with different kinds of hardships. Sensual desires like being in debt. Sloth and drowsiness is like being in prison. Restlessness and anxiety is like being enslaved. Doubt and uncertainty is like traveling across a desert with no surety that you're going to make it to the end. Ill will, he says. Is like being sick. And the name in English tells you your will is ill. Something's wrong. And it's going to get in the way of your concentration. That's what all these hindrances are. They're obstacles to your concentration. They obscure your discernment. They obscure your awareness. So you've got to get past them. And the first step in each case is to try to get past, to see that they're worth getting past. I remember when I first learned about the hindrances and learned that ill will doesn't mean negativity or dislike. It means I actively want to see somebody suffer. And I couldn't see that in my own case I wanted to see anybody suffer. But then I reflected. My first year in particular, when I was meditating on the top of the hill there in Wat Dhammasatit, and the things that would destroy my concentration more than anything else would be thinking back on some injustice, or somebody had done something wrong, or was doing something wrong, and getting away with it. And I could get worked up about that for hours at a time. strong sense of righteous indignation. And that's a lot of what ill will is. You don't like what's happened, and it seems wrong that there's no punishment. People are getting away with things that they, you see clearly they should not be getting away with. But that, the Buddha says, is wrong view. Remember the right attitude to have to somebody who has no good qualities at all is to see that person as a sick person lying by the side of the road in the middle of a desert. Even if that person is a stranger, you would look at them and you say, oh, if only someone could help that person. That's the right attitude to have to someone who's misbehaving, who has no good qualities. And when you keep that image in mind, you have to ask yourself, well, who's sick here? You have to see the other person as sick, and you have to see yourself as sick. You may not be able to do anything about that other person's illness. But you can do something about your own. You've got to change your views. That strong sense of offended justice. You've got to look into that. We've talked about this before. Justice is a sense that you know the beginning of the story, you can tabulate who did what to whom, whose actions can be justified, whose actions cannot. And then you tally up the score. But from the Buddha's point of view, there is no beginning point. You can't say who did what to whom, or who was the first mover in a particular story. It's like coming in on the tail end of a movie. You 
you don't know who got their just desserts. And karma itself doesn't go around giving just desserts. Think of the case of Angulimala. He killed all those people. But then he had a change of heart. The Buddha saw that potential he had for a change of heart, and he went right there. Taught him, Angulimala became an arahant. And he ended up not getting punished for all those murders. There were people who were upset, and they would throw things at him when he went for his alms round. But as the Buddha told him, when Angulimala came back from an alms round with his head bleeding, his robe torn, he said, this is nothing compared with what it would have been if you hadn't gained that attainment. So this should be our attitude toward people who we think are getting away with murder, getting away with injustices, that they see the error of their ways. Change their way of action, because that's how goodness gets established in the world, not by going around and punishing all the wrongdoers, because many times they will not see the fact that they were wrong. You can pile up all kinds of evidence, but if they're unwilling to admit the evidence, they will be more and more firmly entrenched in their wrongness, in their harshness, in their cruelty. The ideal attitude is to wish for them to have a change of heart. And you have to have a change of heart, too. Again, you can't treat that person's illness necessarily, but you can treat yours. by changing your views around it. People are getting away with wrongdoing. May they see the error of their ways. That's the proper attitude. If you're upset that they're not getting punished, that's the beginning of ill will, and that's going to get in the way of your concentration. It's going to aggravate your own illness. So you have to remember, for the sake of training your mind, clearing up your own discernment, you have to focus on the areas where you are doing something wrong right now, and do something about that right now. Because the actions themselves, whether they're skillful or unskillful, will be happy or unhappy. We tend to think of happiness as a product of an action, something we receive. The same with pain. It's the product of the action. But there are passages where the Buddha indicates that the action itself is either the happiness or the pain. After all, he says, in the case of acts of merit, the word act of merit, that's another name for happiness. The happiness is there in the action. Similarly with suffering. Suffering is the clinging. Clinging is an activity. It's something you do. It's when people are misbehaving, treating other people wrongly. They're already suffering. They may not admit it, but that's because their faculties are impaired. When you see that in someone else, you have to turn around and look at yourself. Your desire to see them punished, your faculties are impaired. In your desire, that is creating suffering right there. So when your will is ill like this, and your views are wrong, you've got to treat the will. You've got to treat the views. Remember, one of the consequences of right view is you develop right resolve. The right resolve is non-ill will. Because if you allow your will to take over, not only does it get in the way of your concentration, but it's going to lead you to want to do things and say things. Advocate courses of action that will simply bring more suffering into the world. If you can develop some goodwill for yourself, goodwill for the people who've 
been doing wrong, then there's some hope for the world. After all, you probably don't want to have all your wrong actions tallied up and punished. I'll try to develop the same attitude toward other people and see what you could do to develop some health in your mind. Because when you know that the way to make the mind healthy, then you're in a better position to give a good example to others so they can make their minds healthy as well. And in that way we all benefit. <laughs>